British Columbia's version of the Workers' Compensation Board, an agency to protect workers in the workplace and compensate or look after those workers that do get injured at work is called WorkSafe BC. Unfortunately, the agency has a track record of evading legitimate claims by workers that are injured at work. They denied my claim using incorrect information. The WorkSafe BC medical advisor refuses to acknowledge the information on file that details I was exposed over six times the amount of exposure to radiation that he assumes. He fabricated his recommendation to deny the claim. The case manager knew I was concerned the medical advisor had not used the correct information long before he made his decision to support the medical advisor. Throughout the rest of the video, I will present evidence from WorkSafe's own files that proves they have avoided using the correct information. During my investigation, I found far too many examples of WorkSafe imposing their own half-truth versions of the facts or in some cases intentionally interfering with specialists that are trying to help the injured worker heal. I will present evidence about how much they've increased their assets over and above the amount they need to operate on, or set aside to provide for an injured worker today, or to far into the future for that injured worker. WorkSafe makes a high profit while denying service and charging employers high premiums. The executive compensation package provides the senior executives with high salaries. The previous CEO made almost half a million dollars per year. He used to receive a bonus of approximately 120 until the recent rollback on bonuses in BC. The bonus more a salary top-up than a bonus. The last compensation package he received. No bonus, they just raised the salary to give him the equivalent of the bonus. A reasonable person cannot conclude they make an effort to decide a claim on the facts or apply their own regulations, rules, and procedures in a fair, open, and unbiased manner. In 1972, I used a telerometer while working on a survey crew in the Okanagan. I had a full head of hair then. When the unit was in operation, I passed in very close proximity to the focal point of the transmitting antenna. When it passed in front of the unit, I felt a distinct warming sensation on the left side of my head. The heating sensation persisted the rest of the day, and at night, the sensation continued along with headaches, and prevented me from sleeping. Each time the unit was turned on, I could hear a distinct buzzing sound. I commented on it to my crew partner. He could not hear it and mentioned my experience to the other crew members. While researching the effects of microwave poisoning, I learned the sound is known as the Fry Effect, despite explaining the Fry Effect to WorkSafe BC WCAT people. None recognized the significance of the effect. Dr. Fry stopped investigating the phenomenon because he was concerned that a power density of enough energy to cause the effect was biologically harmful to humans. The photo is a general photo of a telerometer being used, not the crew I was on or the location we used the unit. The units are not familiar to most people involved in surveying. Until recently, I never met another person that had actually used one. He used the units in an interesting different operation about 10 years after my experience. The units he used may have been the same ones as I had used. When he used them, they had large yellow stickers on them, warning to keep a distance of 25 feet when in operation. I passed one of the inches of the focal point of the antenna, and possibly the theoretical focal point of the antenna was inside my head. The 25 feet is particularly significant as a distance as it is approximately the boundary between the intermediate field zone and the far field zone where the intensity drops off at the well-known inverse law, square law rate. In the near and intermediate field zones, the power density pattern is difficult, if possible, to model, and spectacular peaks and valleys of intensity can occur. Safety Code 6 is a document from Health Canada. It applies to the federal government workers and some other groups of people. It does not apply to the general public in Canada. There are no global standards in Canada controlling the amount of radiation one can be subject to in Canada. WorkSafe does insert Safety Code 6 into their regulations and it does apply to the workers in BC. There are a number of scientists and others that feel that Safety Code 6 is far too lax in the amount of radiation a person can be exposed to. In the case of my claim, this argument is relatively immaterial as I was exposed to over three times the amount of radiation as Dr. John Blathwaite calls it, the grossly inadequate Safety Code 6 allows for. Typically, people reference the allowable intensity in watts per square meter. The Canadian safety limits are very similar to the U.S. limits of 10 watts per square meter. 
Note the comparable levels in Russia and China are 0.1 watts per square meter. My exposure was over three times the Canadian limits and 300 times the limit in China and Russia, as well as a number of other countries. The WorkSafe review officer did recognize my exposure exceeded the limits in WorkSafe BC's regulations, but apparently, but not enough to matter. Try explaining to a judge in traffic court that doing 150 in a 50k zone is exceeding the limit by not enough to be a concern. The use of specific absorption rate, or SAR, for within the 200 millimeter limit is Safety Code 6's way of addressing the discussions of near intermediate field zones. The use of SAR in this way is not adequate for many discussions, but in my case does approach addressing the issues. Near, intermediate, and far field zones of radiation have never been acknowledged in any manner by WorkSafe or WCAT. They are not just fuzzy words. They are scientifically established important criteria. Dr. Kane, a former senior research scientist for Motorola, stated in his book, Cellular Telephones Russian Relate, they can be as much as 100 times the expected. Dr. Kane died of a brain tumor that he felt was caused by his exposure to radiation. Strictly speaking, because my exposure was in the 200 millimeter zone, specific absorption rate should have been used, as the original equipment was not available for testing to the SAR limits, only an estimate of a calculation can be used. Fortunately, the code does provide for using power density when SAR is not available. At no point has WorkSafe acknowledged SAR as the appropriate measurement, and it is not available falling back to the power density calculations. The WorkSafe medical advisor did not have the expertise to recognize the need to use SAR if available. The case manager, despite my pleas to him to consult appropriate experts on the subject of radio frequency, did not bother to obtain expert information he required to make a decision. Neither have the direct technical expertise to understand the science they were considering. Subsequent WorkSafe and WGAP personnel failed to understand the necessary science they needed to understand the issues. Industry Canada recognizes the need for the concerns about potential issues related to near field and intermediate field zones. The radio frequency toolkit for environmental health practitioners, a joint project by the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control and the National Collaborating Centre for Environmental Health, primarily at the request of the BC Provincial Health Officer to investigate issues related to microwave radiation. The issues of near field and intermediate field radiation, etc. are foreign to most people and requires a specialized knowledge to have relevant comments or make relevant opinions. The toolkit chapters 2 to 5 are a brief explanation of some of the special factors to consider when discussing radiation. The document should be read before the Industry Canada technical votes if one wishes a reasonable understanding of the Industry Canada pieces. The remaining toolkit document looks closely at some of the human health related issues associated with radiation. The investigation in the document is far from complete in scope. Only male few reproductive issues are considered and female as an example are not. The document does note in the order of 100 human health related issues associated with radiation. It took considerable effort to find the manual for the telerometer. The original company has gone through a number of ownership changes, possibly to break the trail of an official successor for company. From another source, I was able to obtain the manual. The manual contained the critical information required to calculate the intensity of the exposure. The manual had the input power and the degree of concentration of the beam of radiation. It also included information on the modulation of the beam. And the degree size of the beam it was possible to calculate the dB gain of the antenna is 28 dB gain. The technical data is supported from other sources. The correct technical information was conveyed to WorkSafe BC in the letter of April 7th, 2011. The medical advisor created his medical opinion two weeks after the April 7th, 2011 letter was received on file at WorkSafe BC. 
The medical opinion contains numerous errors in fact, unsupported leaps of logic, and false innuendos. The medical advisor was not even capable of getting the date correct for my first visit with the surgeon. Apparently, the surgeon never saw me until eight years after he did an 11 and a half hour brain surgery operation on me. In some ways, an inconsequential error in transcribing, but an example of the logic of thought, effort, and fact checking that went into the opinion. The case manager was advised of a number of the errors in the medical advisor's opinion the day the opinion was created. Long before the case manager made his decision, there is no evidence the case manager made an effort to investigate the concerns. The medical advisor has never met me, spoken to me on the phone, or had any other direct contact with me. He certainly has a lot to say about me and my personal situation for a person that has not even met me. The continual refusal on the part of the WorkSafe medical advisor to acknowledge the power density or intensity of the exposure was more than six times the amount he comments on has no logical rationale unless he knows full well that exposure to the power density three times the level that is deemed harmful by WorkSafe regulations is of course harmful and there are no reasonable grounds to deny the claim. WorkSafe BC certainly does well financially. For the year 2013, WorkSafe's total assets increased by 1 billion 300 million. The total funded position increased in 2013 by approximately 800 million. The CEO in 2013 received a total compensation package of over $450,000. He retired at the end of June 2014. It will be interesting to see the amount in the long service benefit column in 2014. Are they as generous to their rank and file employees? WorkSafe appears to be an entity unto itself, not responsible to the public, the employers, or the workers. Who do they report to and take direction from? The facts have been made available to the Minister Responsible WorkSafe BC. No response addressing the issues has been received. The current CEO of WorkSafe BC is Diane Mills. WorkSafe has had the proof the medical advisor did not use the correct power density value in July 2014. They opened a new claim for me. They have a rule that they cannot reverse a decision based on incorrect information supplied by WorkSafe personnel if they have already made a decision. A curious position as they give themselves the authority to reopen a claim if the claimant gave false information and reverse the claim. I assume they would also lay criminal charges in particularly egregious situations. Not a surprise that the rules only work one way to benefit themselves. Yes, my full head of hair. Shortly after I was zapped, a number of subtle changes in my life began to occur. Of themselves minor, but when I looked at as a group, they point to some event that triggered them. Hair loss is a prime sign of microwave poisoning and some other classes of radiation poisoning. The next presentation in this series will focus on Workers' Compensation Appeal Tribunal. As they say, the final level of appeal in the workers' compensation system of British Columbia and is independent of WorkSafe BC, or as the WorkSafe Board of Directors manual calls it, the quasi judicial adjutant functions of WorkSafe BC and the Workers' Compensation Appeal Tribunal are governed by policy created and published by the Board of Directors. Confused how an independent body can report to the organization that they are independent of? So am I. It cannot be an unreasonable expectation that one's WorkSafe claim be assessed on, in an unbiased manner on the facts. It appears that WorkSafe PC does not feel workers with claims should be allowed this fundamental piece of natural justice or due process. One-on-one, -on -one, WorkSafe BC has the advantage over us. United together, we can effect a change in WorkSafe BC. They are mandated to serve the injured worker, employer, and the public of BC. They are failing these people. Contact me at worksafe at sios.ca to effect a positive change in WorkSafe BC.